Hello and welcome to tonight's broadcast. We're going a little bit earlier than usual. We're just testing things out, see how that works out. Maybe it won't. I can already see I'm starting to skip. Everything's a little choppy and jumpy and whatnot, which is not very fun, but it is It is what it is. Um, okay, we're going to launch right into this. We're going to launch right into our topic. Hold on, I'm just going to open my can of seltzer. I have some, what's it called? This is a uh, key lime. Now, normally LaCroix, they make a lime seltzer, but the lime sensor, the lime seltzer has nothing on the key lime. It's all about the key lime seltzer. There is an extra note of flavor in the key lime seltzer that just I can't describe it. It's great. But we're talking about Nazis today. Okay. That's what we're talking about. We are talking about Nazis and we're talking about Jews and we're talking about the mob. Why have they not made this movie yet? You would think that this would be a movie that they would want to make. You know, it just has all those buzzwords. Jews versus Nazis. We're going to be saying that word a lot in tonight's stream. Okay. So today's article, today's article du jour comes from a website that I frequent from time to time, but we have not used too much on the channel, but we're going to, we're going to change that right now. It's called all that's interesting. Let's go to all that's interesting pop right open there we are Woo there it is okay and this was written by neil patmore and checked by adam farley and it was published very recently on august 29th 2020 okay hey what's up ben how you doing welcome to tonight's stream thank you for joining us okay Let's take a look, shall we? Oh, can I X out this little advertisement? I don't think I can. In 1938, a judge, a rabbi, and a Jewish gangster got together and came up with a plan to beat up America's Nazi sympathizers whenever and wherever they tried to march. Hmm. That sounds like the beginning of a joke, right? A little bit. What's up, DLW? He says, Illinois, Illinois Nazis. I hate Illinois Nazis. Okay. Let's 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 dive into it. So that was our opening our opening sentence. Sounds like a uh whatchamacallit? So 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 here's something that maybe people do or do not know who have a very general knowledge. You know, we think now, well, it's kind of weird. Because right now in today's social climate, you know, white supremacy, fascism, and Nazism has become a lot more acceptable within certain, you know, for certain types of people. It's rather terrifying. But before World War II, before the Nazi party tried to take over the world, right, um, there was a there was a Nazi party in America, National Socialist Party in America. As a matter of fact, if you've ever seen what's that? Oh, Penny Dreadful did a sequel series called City of Angels, I think. And there is a whole subplot about the American Nazi Party, and it is fascinating. It's really, really interesting. Uh, it's an interesting show, and it's terrifying to think that you know that nazism was so openly and nonchalantly accepted in the 30s because that's where we're kind of time traveling to we're, we're going to the 30s so world war ii has not fully erupted yet but i'm sure i you know that's me telling this off the top of my head i'm sure that our writer friend here what's his name i forgot his name already but neil will will really break things down so this picture you see right here this is a parade and as you can see, there's a Nazi flag, and this is New York City. The German-American Bund, B-U-N-D, marches down East 86th Street in New York City, the center of uh, the center of the city's German population. 
That is just, I mean, that is really, that's really disconcerting. Have you seen those pictures of the KKK marching at, at Washington, D.C., on Washington, D.C. in front of the Capitol, you know, like like tons of them in their white hoods and whatnot. But um, I don't know. There's just something about like this. And yes, obviously you have these fringe elements. They're not even really fringe anymore. The, the alt, alt light, alt right, whatever you want to call it, all of it is is bubbling i mean look at what happened in charlottesville virginia right like it's all it's all brewed to the surface so this really isn't that shocking so let's pretend that this is actually the year 2010 and then maybe we'll be a little bit more shocked by a picture of a swastika flag marching down uh east 86th street in new york city that would that's yeah <laughs> DLW says the opening sentence was like a regular bar joke. I applaud these dudes though. Good job. Greg says I wrote a pilot called 4F Operation Underworld. I guess that's some insider baseball. Like that's what the that's what the thing was. That's the thing. The thing of the thing that that has something to do with that. I don't know. Let's keep reading though. In 1938, American Nazis and their recruiting platform, the German American Bund, posed a very real threat to U.S. sovereignty. But a New York judge and some patriotic Jewish mobsters came on the scene to stop them. That year became the opening salvo in the fight between America's Jewish mob and Nazis. Give me the HBO show. Give me the the you know one hour prestige drama dramatized serialized show of that that's what i want to see i'm imagining boardwalk empire but with jewish mobsters and nazis like give me give me that show if i was an executive if i ruled if i ran the zoo that is i would be green lighting that in two friggin seconds man uh, Michelle agrees with me. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Michelle says that if this was 2010, it would be very shocking. And yeah, that's what it is, man. Like it, it like it's weird to think like now because I was trying to I was going to say it. it's so shocking to see that today. And then I'm thinking it's really not that shocking to see that today. And that's how scary. And, and what has it been? It's been 10, 12 years. It's amazing how this stuff insidiously sneaks up on us. You know what I mean? And now suddenly it's kind of common and normal. It's normal. But again, yeah, pre, you know, if it's the aughts, early 2000s, late 90s, you'd be like, oh, oh my God, Nazis. Because it just seems like we beat the Nazis, the end. The Nazis are gone. That was, you know, uh, what's a much uh, Sauron was defeated. You know, uh, his body isn't around anymore, that sort of thing. And, and it's just, that's just not the case. Oh, that's Greg's series. Greg, what's your series about? You can't just, you can't just name drop a series and not explain why it's connected to this, that, or the other. Um, let's keep reading, shall we? On April 20th, 1938, the German American Bund goose stepped and goose stepped. As we know, that's the, the way that's the shuffle of the Nazi party. They goose step, goose stepped its way towards the Yorkville Casino on Manhattan's Upper East Side in honor of Hitler's 49th birthday. That's right. Hitler's born on 420. Their leader, Fritz Kuhn, was due to speak in a ballroom decorated with swastikas and spread Jewish hate. On stage, he often imitated Hitler in full Sig Hale spit mode. So doing like the Hitler, like the whatever I can't. That was that wasn't Hitler. I don't have a Hitler, so that's why I can't. I, you know, I have impressions, as you know. Sometimes that was not a that was not a, that was not a Hitler at all. I don't know what what is or isn't. Uh, Angus says not shocking, but is shocking simultaneously. Exactly, man. Exactly. That's that's. Yes, that that's literally what it is. You know, I ate some something spicy for dinner and I can already feel the reflux. They don't tell that to you when you enter your 30s that the reflux is one of those things when you get older just ugh, hate it. However, little did Kun, again, that's the leader of the American Nazi party. Little did Kun know, I think I'm pronouncing that right, that a group of Jewish mobsters led by Meyer Lansky and secretly contracted by Judge Nathan D. Perlman. So it's a Jewish judge 
with with uh, Jewish mobsters. Now, how could a judge and mobs? How could a judge of the law and mobsters get together? Well, there's a lot of ways, but I will. I mean, I just want to pause for a minute and talk about the Jewish factor here as a Jew. And I know that this exists for a lot of, I don't know what you would call us. I guess, I guess we're, I, 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 it's weird. I'm white, but I'm also part of a minority. Like I, can I be both? Do I intersect at both? I'm Ashkenazi, but do I, where's, where's the intersection? How does that work? In any case, my point being is that like, many other sort of minority groups or groups of color. I'll give a great example. And I've heard, I've heard black friends have, have sort of relayed this to me as well. There's this sort of like, if you're a black person and you see another black person, everybody else is white. And even if you don't know that black person, this is a very grossly generalized thing, but it's very, it's very real. Um, that there is some sort of acknowledgement. Hey, I, you are black and I am black. Like there's like that thing and it exists as well for Jews. I don't know ex if it exists for other populations, minority populations, whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I'm not using the right terminology here, but there is a, there's a, there's sort of like when you, when you, it's like you take note of the person that's like you in a situation where almost all the time you are other because a lot of the time or you know there are times where you're the only jew or where you might maybe you're the only black person maybe you you know what i'm saying like that sort of thing and it's like it's sort of like a one thing is not quite the other now in the case of me i am as i said ashkenazi ashkenazi white jew so therefore i you know blend in but someone who is black stands out more than someone who is not black in a group perhaps full of caucasian white people whatever you want to call it um i have a feeling this video is going to get severely suppressed or shadow banned or something i don't know but we're doing it we're doing it because we're doing it my point being is that there is a in groups where in groups in groups that experience adversity on some level there is some sort of common, there's a commonality, uh, there's a fraternity or, you know, I don't want to, it's not a male only thing, whatever. I don't know what you call, not a sorority, not a, okay, Rue knows what I'm talking about. Rue is a minority. Rue, what is your background, sir? I know you are, you, you are some, some sort of something. I, I do not know if, if, I don't know if you feel like sharing, you don't have to, if it makes you feel uncomfortable in any way, shape or form. But thank you for chiming in there because I was beginning to sweat thinking like, am I just making this up? Because I don't think I'm making this up, man. You know, it's like a thing like you when you see someone else of your ilk of your cloth, there is some sort of I don't can't explain it. There is a there is like a deep like primordial like sort of sensation of like not safety, but like synergy like okay uh rue is is spanish and italian there you go there is a synergy you know what i mean there's like a synergy of hey we're, we're both jews hey we're both black hey we're both spanish i guess you know what i mean like that and um so the idea of so to bring this back around to my point, the point I was trying to make that a mobster on one side of the law and a judge on the other side of the law come together under the banner of their Judaism. That's what I'm trying to get at. That's what I'm saying there. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, there's a knowing it's a knowing. What's up, Lynn? How are you? Yeah, Greg says bond is the word. Yeah, you just you just sort of, you know, especially if you've experienced some sort of anti-Semitism or, you know, if you've experienced racism, I'd imagine as a black person, if you've had if you have had experiences, you know, uh, uh, discriminatory experiences, when you see a, a, another person that's just like you you feel a sense of knowing and synergy and, and uh, familiarity that 
no one else in that room is going to understand. And so I'd imagine that Perlman, the judge, and Lansky, the mobster, are going, we're both Jews and we both know what Nazism is. Because here's the other thing, too. And I mean, like, I guess this requires a little bit more explanation than maybe I thought it would. You got to understand this, too. And again, I can't speak to this because I'm not black, but I have. But from what I've heard from, you know, friends and just heard people just just heard heard people sharing their experience in that, like this idea of like, no, you don't understand. I know, like you, you claim you understand. You don't understand. You don't understand. Like, I'm telling you, 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 you don't see it because you don't have to deal with the thing, whatever the thing is. But we deal with it every day. We know it's very clear. It's very blatant to us. You know, I'd imagine, you know, again, like microaggressions, stuff like that. It's the same thing. It's the same thing with anti-Semitism. It's the same thing. And people who are not Jewish do not understand. They don't get it. They just don't get it. And in the 30s, when, you know, things are cooking up, uh, you know, across the pond and whatnot. But first of all, there's no, there's no Twitter. There's no TikTok. There's no Instagram. There's no YouTube. If you want to see something, you're going to see newsreels in a, in a, in a theater. The general person, there were so many people that were so ignorant to what was happening to the Jews in Germany, in Europe. It didn't start with the Holocaust, man. It started, you know, you've heard of the night of broken glass. You've heard of the ghettos. I mean, it started, it started way earlier and the Jews were aware of it. The Jews knew what was going on and, you know, other people didn't, or at least not as much. Do you know what I'm trying to say here? And so the idea that this judge and a mobster are going like, yeah, we got, we know what's going on here. We, this, this is, we've got to try and put a stop to this. We got to oust this from where we live. We could deal with each other later. It's like in the Rocketeer when the G men and the mobsters team up when they find out that Timothy Dalton is a Nazi spy for uh, Hitler trying to get the, the Rocketeer backpack, that sort of thing. Um, Greg says, besides the Bund, you had Father uh, Conlon pushing anti-Semitic propaganda. Sure. There was a lot that, listen, <laughs> we still have it going on today. Still have it going on today. All right, let's keep reading. I, I could, I could literally, I didn't realize I could spin a yarn about this, this, uh, this topic here. Okay, let's keep going. Let us keep going. Um, so, however, little did Kuhn know that the group of Jewish mobsters led by Meyer Lansky and secretly contracted by Judge Nathan D. Perlman were waiting. Armed with baseball bats and pool cues, Lansky's crew had split up into three groups covering every exit point. Then, when all members of the Bund were present, the gangsters attacked. Let's look up the definition of Bund. Is Bund? It's a very, very interesting word. Let's see. Let's see what they say about Bund here. Bund is uh, an association, especially a political one. Uh, Bund, a pro-Nazi German-American organization of the 1930s. Okay, I think that gives us a better understanding when we're using this word Bund, right? So everybody on the same page here? It's an association, especially a political one, uh, a pro-Nazi German-American organization, 1930s. What's up, Aaron? Welcome to the uh, welcome to the chat. Come join us over on YouTube. Uh, Angus says uh, Twitter of the 1930s was a Henry Ford newspaper. <laughs> Racist Twitter of the 1930s. Right. Right. Ain't it the truth, man? All right. So so they basically split up into three groups. They had baseball bats and pool cues and they covered every exit point. And then when all the members of the Bund were present, the gangsters attacked within minutes. New York's Jewish mob rooted the Nazi, routed, rooted, routed the Nazis. And although I don't know what they mean by routed, Jew, New, that's a weird word to use there too. Neil, what do you what 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 kind of word is this for this? Let's look that up as well. 
uh, a disorderly retreat or defeated troops. Okay. So they routed, meaning that they now uh, they, well, it's being used as a verb here. I think actually they routed the Nazis causing them to retreat. And although it was the first time that the mobsters disrupted an anti-American meeting of Nazis, it wouldn't be the last. Cause here's the thing, even though the Nazis were clearly, they, they hated Jews. They, they wanted, uh, they wanted to get, you know, rid of the Jews and whatnot. I mean, make no mistake. This was not good for anybody, but Jewish or not, this was not good for you. This was anti-American. It's not just anti-Jew. It's anti-American. You know what I'm saying? Like it was, it was good. It was good for all of, it was good for everybody for the, for the Nazis to get punched in the face, I guess. I'm very curious to see if this, this, this video is probably going to be demonetized. What can you do? It's something I wanted to talk about. I find this stuff fascinating. The insidious rise, especially right now, especially what's going on with Trump right now. And, and you know, if you are on Twitter, you saw what, ha you know, what was trending about how the new salute at Trump rallies is to hold your finger up like this. Look, like this. What does that remind you of? Holding a finger up like that. Does that remind you of another kind of salute? And that's what everybody's in a in a in a flurry about. And you know, I mean, here's the thing about you know, people want to call Trump fascist, and I do believe he is fascist to an extent. But I think that it's more accurate to say he's a Trumpist, and Trumpist is fascist. So Trump isn't. It's like Trumpism is fascism, but it's really just. It's really just all about it's all about Trump as the central figure. So it's this weird, you know what it is? It's like a fascist cult. That's what it is, man. That's what it is. That's what we're dealing with right now, you know, or what is been slowly uh fermenting and bubbling to the surface. So uh so the title of this is The Insidious Rise of Nazism in America. A rise of fascism took hold in America in the late 1930s, replicating Adolf Hitler's rise to power in Germany. So here's some uh, Nazi. Man. So this is Fritz. This is Fritz Kuhn, the leader of the German-American Bund at a rally at Madison Square Garden. Could you imagine there was a Nazi rally at Madison Square Garden, February 20th, 1939? Isn't that crazy to think about? And, you know. Additionally, I you got to watch Penny Dreadful City of Angels because they really I mean, they cover this, man. They cover this really well. The Bund is in is in Los Angeles. And that's part of the subplot is that Hitler wants to sort of uh, take over L.A. By 1938, America had the third highest German population in the world. The German-American Bund, led by fascist Fritz Kuhn, took full advantage, holding regular gatherings and marches celebrating Hitler in the Third Reich. They pledged total allegiance to Germany. Kuhn and the Bund espoused hate on the Jewish problem, also known as the, uh, the Jewish question, mind you. Uh, he said that Jews were communists who supposedly held all the money in America. Does that make any sense? Why would a commun commun how could a communist hold money? Isn't that the opposite of being a communist that everybody has the same amount of money? So it's, what, what is it, man? Are, are Jews the ultra, you know, the 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 bank, uh, the bank crazy, you know, wealthy elite Illuminati, or are they communists? It's like whatever, you know, that's a thing. It's like Jew is other. We've always been other. So even though I'm white. Even though I can pass for Italian, I could pass for anything else. I am still other. And I'm still, and it, if I, you know, in certain areas of the country, I would be really other. And, you know, again, go seek out the video. You know, I talked about this when I was touring with Blitzkid and we were in the, the deep South. I told, you know, I talked about my experience we ended up at essentially a, a neo-Nazi motor uh, motorcycle club, uh, and it was it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. And um, you know, like, I, what would have happened if they knew I was Jewish? And I did something really 
stupid. Go watch the story. I think Loki, it's an episode I did with Loki, you know. Um, but yeah, it just it's crazy, man. It's it's crazy. Uh, Angus says, I have seen films of the Nazi party rally with huge image of George Washington in the background. Yeah, it's scary. Is this Don? Wait, what? Is this uh, D is this uh, Donald like Donald from Legal Seafood? Donald, Donald Lawrence, how are you, Ben? Are you okay? How you been, dude? Illumi this is something that Donald would say. Donald would say that 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 the Jews are Illuminati. Okay, there you go. Here you go. Your standard Jewish conspiracy theory, of course. Um, hope you're well, Donald. Speaking of fascism, there was also the business plot, says Ben. Uh, Michael Hall says, just like they had massive Klan rallies in Washington, D.C. at one time. Yes, Michael, before you arrived, I mentioned that briefly. Michael, do you know what year that was? I am not positive of the year, but yeah. Uh, Greg says, Khan called for FDR, called FDR Franklin Rosenfeld. Yeah, but FDR was anti-Semitic too. You know, there's a there's a Ken Burns documentary. I haven't seen it yet about America's reaction response to the Holocaust, and it's like it's pretty dark. From my understanding, it's pretty dark. From off the top of my head, you know, America did not intervene when they knew they knew what was going on, and they waited a very very long time. In fact, I guess you would say that they, I say this in quotes, redeem themselves redeem themselves by you know coming and you know d-day and whatnot but the america played a america is not innocent you know it's interesting very very interesting um so yeah so that story that i was talking about though that that story about being in the neo-nazi I try, you know, normally I bury the lead because it it's a great story. It's a good, it's, it's a good tale. Go check it out. It's on my YouTube channel. Uh, I have already spoiled it, but it, it's, you know, it, it made my, it, it's, it's, it's a toe cool. It's a toe curler. If you're a Jew, I'll tell you that much. And I'll tell you, had that happened today, that was 10 years ago. Had that happened today, I absolutely would not have the disposition that I have now. It doesn't really bother me. But if it happened today, I would be terrified. I would be mortified. But back then, it was, it, it, I was so much, it was more naive. I was more naive. And believe me, I'd been, you know, I'd seen plenty anti Semitism wise, but I, you know, oof. All right, let's, let's keep, let's keep going. I remember a Klan rally. Angus says, I remember a Klan rally in DC in the 1980s when I went to visit. It was not pretty. Thank you, Michael. Michael says it's 1926, and we've seen we've all seen that scratchy black and white footage. That scratchy black and white footage. Okay, let's keep going, shall we? Uh, so, Khan and Bund espoused hate on the Jewish problem. He said that Jews were communists who supposedly held all the money in America. Hitler knew of the Bund's existence and approved of it. He hoped to brainwash the country into supporting him rather than facing Germany in war again, because World War I and whatnot, do you remember? The Bund presented itself as a Germany, uh, uh, the Bund presented itself as Germany-loving Americans. In reality, they goose-stepped, sig-hailed, and spittled their anti-Semitic rhetoric across the U.S., and they were more or less free to do so because the laws against hate speech didn't yet exist. In the 1930s. Now, mind you, there were a couple of entertainers who did speak out, some of which were Jewish. You had the Three Stooges that were, you know, really poking fun at Hitler, I believe, but pre World War II. I, ah, when was you Nazi spy? That I think that was before World War II. You also had The Great Dictator, which was a Charlie Chaplin short. And, you know, uh, there were there were some, you know, I, I you know, I really should have checked to see if those were pre World War Two or post World War Two. There's more significance if it was pre World War Two, obviously, because it's easy to hit to hate Hitler a lot more or to care more about how evil Hitler is once we've entered World War Two. 
but I'd imagine, or, you know, how much, how much, how did Americans feel? I'm sure there's some censuses out there. How did Americans feel about World War II before Pearl Harbor was attacked? I mean, I'm sure they hated it, but I feel like you probably had like tons of isolationists going, yeah, not a problem. We're not going to worry about it. We already did. We're not doing that again with what, what happened with World War One. We're not going to go back down that route. You know, it's it's sticky. You know, it's a really it's a sticky situation. You know what else is sticky? <laughs> riot stickers. Whoa. Riot stickers are sticky. Riot stickers are the riot stickers, the official um sponsor of the from us youtube channel these stickers are made out of vinyl they are shiny they are sticky they are great i put them up everywhere uh they also do banners and t-shirts look at this beautiful banner that they did uh check them out riotstickers.com we we love riot stickers so if you have any like if you have needs if you have sticker printing needs go go through your business to riotstickers.com uh, they're an independent business. They are personable and um, they know how to work with the customer. And uh, I can't say enough good things about it's nice to have a sponsor that I, be I believe in this sponsor. You know, you could get a sponsor that maybe you don't even believe in the sponsor. I believe in this sponsor. You know what I'm saying? It's like that. So let's play our little our, our commercial and we will be right back with more Jewish mobsters versus Nazis. And we're back, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Let's keep, let's keep rolling, shall we? Uh, so hates, so hate speech laws did not exist yet. And so people were just free to just, you know, spout their, their anti-Semitic, anti-American hate, that sort of thing. Um, Yorkville in upper Manhattan had the highest congregation of Germans in New York and East 86th street was nicknamed sauerkraut Boulevard. The bund was brazen, which means like bold and brash. Uh, they held massive rallies along the streets in brown shirted swastika uniforms. Now, mind you, mind you consider this too. consider the fact that you know, that that that's kind of like what we're dealing with right now in that you have this veneer. There's a veneer of like, oh, you know, we're just German loving Americans like that's it like that. that It's the same thing. That's what that's what that's what the alt right kind of they hide behind that in their own sort of way to I mean, look at again, look at the Proud Boys. They hide the veneer of their of their slogan. Uh, we're Western chauvinists. We're not white supremacists. We're Western chauvinists. Think about that. Think about what a Western chauvinist. What is Western? Western is European. And what is a chauvinist? To be better than. It's white supremacy, rebranded, relabeled, more insidious than ever. And yeah, Michael Hall says, sorry to, sorry, off topic, but I would love if you could check out my morning noise meets DIY. Cemetery static on Bandcamp new track. Congratulations, man. Yeah, dude. Uh, send me an email just to send it to me in an email, man. Uh, video business media.com. Okay. Back to what we're back to what we're talking about here. A respected judge enlisted gangsters to fight Nazis. We know that already. 
New York judge and former Congressman Nathan D. Perlman became concerned with the Bund's growing presence in New York City. He knew the Bund had freedoms of assembly and speech afforded to them under the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment. So here's a dude who knows the law, who is Jewish, and who is very you know, aware of the insidious danger that is occurring. As author Michael Benson recounts in his book, Gangsters versus Nazis, how Jewish mobsters battled Nazis in wartime America. What does this remind you of? This is Antifa versus the Proud Boys all over again, you know, um, in a weird kind of way. It's uh, history does repeat itself. Um, I, you know, I don't know if you could. I don't think that Jewish gangsters and Antifa believe in the same things but they are both fighting a white supremacist fascist element in the streets, like gang brawl, that sort of thing. Um, Biz says, this is all news to me. They don't teach this sort of thing in history. It's sad. They don't. And I'll tell you this too. I'll tell you this too. And this is, this is important. I think this is, this is important. You know, you can go to Washington DC and you can go to every museum in Washington, D.C., and I'll tell you, you're not going to really learn the truth about America. You're not going to see America's history until you go to the African-American Museum of History, American history. And that's there's plenty of stuff they didn't teach you in the classroom. What we have, what we were taught growing up was a very sanitized, patriotic, you know, viewpoint when in reality i mean our the foundation of america is one that is predicated and built on slavery you know and genocide but they don't they don't talk about it they don't want that's not it's it's a shame and just in the same way that you know germans today ger generation i was talking i think i was talking about this with my mom i think i was talking about this with my mom actually very recently and we were talking about how, you know, for them, for Germans, there it's a trauma. It's a generational trauma that, you know, it's a it's a national shame, you know, the the their the, the fascist roots of their country. And it's so fresh, it's still so new, it can't be forgotten, it can't be swept under the rug. You know, media is too advanced for for that. You know what I mean? Like there's too much media. There's too many black and white films. There's too many photographs. There's too many testimonies. So it's this thing that Germans have to deal with today. And, you know, I mean, I can't speak for, again, I've been making a lot of gross generalization, generalized comments, like what I was saying about minorities, the, the, the fraternity between minorities and whatnot. But, you know, the idea of like being singularly in a room with someone else who is of your ilk and sort of knowing, having that knowing, having that understanding of like, hey, we are we are this and, you know, whatever, that sort of thing. Um, I explained it earlier in the uh, in, in, in the in the video in this stream. You can you can rewind if you want. But um yeah, that 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 Germans that there is it's a Shonda man. It's a Shonda. It's a it's a Shempa. It's a uh, it's a trauma. It's a it's a sadness. It's a shame, and they're you know vehemently vehemently anti-fascist. It's illegal. Did you know that it is illegal to purchase or to own or possess swastikas in Germany? That's how, that's what I'm talking about. That's the Greg. Uh, can you speak to any of the, what I am saying right now? Greg seems to be a real buff the guy in the comments. I'd love to hear uh, his thoughts on that. Um, I spent a lot of time in Germany and that was my observe. Those were my observations from the people. And I was all over Germany. And the, that was, that was something that I gleaned. It wasn't like I was asking Germans, Hey, so Nazi Germany, huh? but like, you know, when whenever occasionally it might come up in conversation or whatever po politics come up in conversation and you see that it's like there's this p 
pivot to be on the opposite side of anything that could be perceived as fascist in any way, shape, or form because of this trauma. So that the idea that there's this, uh, maybe amongst the younger, uh, certain younger, and again, this was 10 years ago, so I don't know how things have changed. I know things actually changed a lot. I know that, uh, you know, my uncle lives in Germany and so does my cousin. And um, I do know things have changed. So I'm really not going to speak any more about it because I really don't. I'm not well-versed enough to to really be doing so. Here's a picture of the judge, Nathan D. Perlman, a real hero, if you ask me, to rid our country of Nazis. Nazis. Know what I'm saying? Um, Ryan says, hi, Jeff. Just so you know, I'm from Germany. Germany ignores all the Christian killings. I don't know what you mean by that. You're going to have to elaborate, uh, Ryan, please, um, because I don't understand what you're saying. The Bund had a camp in which they encouraged teenagers to get pregnant. Wow. Okay, you need to elaborate on that, too. What is that all about? All of Lansky's wartime efforts were redacted. Huh. Okay, let's uh <laughs> let's keep on uh on a moving. Uh what those Nazis needed is a good ass whipping, Perlman said. And he knew just the man for the job. Mobster Meyer Lansky. Well, if it was redacted, it's not redacted anymore because we're we're talking about him now. Meyer Lansky, according to Benson, it is still unclear exactly how Perlman knew Lansky, maybe from synagogue. You know, Jews know, Jews get around. Jews know each other very well. Very uh, lots of connective tissue uh, there and whatnot. Michael Hall, Michael, we were taught, Michael, you missed the beginning of the stream. We were talking about this very thing, but uh, we're, we're clearly on the same wavelength here. Michael brings up again. The, the, the movie, The Rocketeer, the gangsters turned on the Nazi villains when they found out because uh, they were Americans. You know, Michael, it makes me wonder if that is actually based on this or if that's that it's rooted. Uh, it's rooted. It's history. The history of that going to the screen is rooted in this. That sort of thing. Um, For instance, they erect a monument and remember of all the Jews that died at a specific site. They ignore all the Christians and homosexuals killed. Um, I'm pretty sure that is not true. Sorry to say, Ryan. Um, and if you go, look, if you go to Yad Vashem, as I have been, if you go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., you will see all of those peoples acknowledged. Um I, this is too, this is a very, this is a very blanketed sort of statement here. And I don't really know how to say anything else, but I don't think you're, I, I, I don't think you're correct on that politely, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And that is that. Uh, Perlman and Lansky knew each other because of synagogue, maybe. Oy vey. With the Michigas. But it must have been outside the arena of the justice system. Obviously, they knew each other outside of the justice system. And that would make for the core of a really, really great show, if you ask me. Perlman called Lansky and asked him point blank, you got some boys who might want to punch a Nazi? <laughs> What a great conversation. Meyer Lansky, the foremost Jewish racketeer and mob gambling czar, was highly respected across the underworld. He had a team of Jewish killers at his disposal, dubbed the Murder Inc., a Brooklyn-based crew that served as the enforcement arm of the Italian and Jewish mobs. Uh, as Benson writes, Lansky's reply to Perlman implied his power. Respectfully, you understand that we can do better than punch. Mm. Um, for instance, Jewish Americans make it a holiday to go to these sites, and Germany knows this. Um, just saying it's not right. I mean, dude, 
we have okay first of all i think what you're referring to is our holocaust memorial day to remember those who perished in the holocaust and you know again i'm you know no one is excluded from that okay no one is excluded from that I don't know where, why you, why you think that, but nobody is excluded from that, from this, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just Christians. It wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just gay people who were, who were, who were gassed and executed in those camps, but it was also the Ro the Romani, Rom 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 I can't pronounce it. Ro Romanians, Romanians. I don't want to use the G word. It's not a very nice word. You can't say that word anymore. It's, it's been banned just like the R word and the F word. You can't say the G word. So you know what I'm talking about? Uh, Romanians that cut that they travel in caravans that them, they too, were, they too suffered as well as those with disabilities, mental and physical disabilities, Catholics, you know, all of them, you call them travelers. I like that. I like that. I like that. Yes. A lot of the, a lot of people perished in the Holocaust. What's so what's, you know, I'm getting really off topic here, but what's so insane about the, uh, you know what? I don't want it to go there because it's just not, let's not go there. Let's not go there. I was going to talk about the, the systemic nature of the Holocaust and why it was, why it's so insanely grave. There are so many anti-Semitic people out there who think that, you know, Jews dwell on the Holocaust too much. And it's just, I don't think, I don't think people can cognitively understand. And for that matter too, you know, again, there's been a resurgence of understanding and enlightenment about what the Confederate no, oh, don't apologize, Ryan. Don't apologize. It's okay, man. I'm I'm gonna stick to the topic. I will. I will. There is um there there is uh there seems to be a resurgence of enlightenment about what the Confederate flag represents for black people and what slavery and plantations are for black people in the same sense, man. In the same sense. Slavery, 400 years of slavery, that was that was their Holocaust. And, you know, to, what Ryan was talking about, those sites, the sites in Germany, the camps, we have our camps here in America, too. They're called plantations and grave atrocities were committed there. And now people have weddings. Can you believe that? You can have a wedding at a plantation where people were you know, enslaved and murdered and just, and, you know, R worded essayed. I can't say that word. It will just, I can't even imagine what this, vi this video is toast, toast on YouTube. It's just never, I don't know why I chose this topic, but I did because we wanted to talk about it. All right. All right. Back, back to the, back to the thing. So Meyer Lansky, the foremost Jewish racketeer and mob gambling czar was highly respected across the underworld. He had a team of Jewish killers at his disposal, dubbed the Murder Inc., a Brooklyn-based crew that served as the enforcement arm of the Italian and Jewish mobs. As Benson writes, Lansky's reply to Perlman <laughs> implied his power. He said, respectfully, you understand we can do better than punch. I love that. Perlman wanted the Nazis injured only, not killed. Beating Nazis to death was poor public relations. Don't worry, Lansky reportedly said. We'll marinate them, but we won't ice them. I mean, and then, like, could you imagine in this theoretical, this hypothetical show that we're talking about, this HBO uh, Boardwalk Empire style show of Jewish gangsters versus Nazis, that at the core of the protagonistic conflict, you have this judge on one side of the law and you have Jewish mobsters and they're both Jewish and they both want to hurt the Nazis, but the, the judge doesn't want them killed and the mobsters do. I mean, it just, it, it just really, um, it, it, it just really, uh, uh, it, it's profound. And Ryan, I, I'm listen, I know you're from Germany, man, but that is not, it's not accurate, man. It's not entirely accurate that nobody uh, slaves did not 
slaves didn't really that's not the right way to say it you can't say slaves earned their freedom it doesn't that's not that's not that's very problematic and i can't get into why but it's very problematic and yes holocaust yes holocaust was it was meant to be a death sentence it was liquidation of people and not just people but i mean people don't understand but you know maybe i will do an episode on this in the future you don't understand like how jewish europe was there was so all of the like jewishness of europe was exterminated it was wiped it was wiped man you know movie theaters and just like in all sorts of institutions synagogues all sorts of stuff language like just innate like yiddish barely survived the holocaust you know what i'm saying barely survived the holocaust yiddish is the language of the ashkenazi jews it's german and hebrew my last name from us from us the name of this channel is yiddish a, a a broken um hybrid language that will soon be dead you know um there's a okay now i gotta find it let me see if i can find it here because we're we're talking about this i think i just x'd out my live am i still oh no i'm still here i'm still here cool i'm gonna i'm gonna read this to you guys before we continue on we're almost done here anyway let me see i think so yeah i think we're almost done here there since we're talking about the holocaust and why i'm just i'm gonna read this real quick because i think you will find it profound this this sort of blew my hair back and you know again when uh, you hear all the time, you know, people are conflating. People don't understand what the word Zionist is, what a Zionist is, what Zion Zionism is and what it is all about. Zionism simply means that literally this is all it means. It just means a place, a state, a place where Jews can be safe and have of their own. That's literally all it means. And it gets, you know, I don't even want to now I got I don't even want to go there with what that what that's all about. But basically, hold on, I'm having trouble with this. Basically, you have a lot of anti anti uh Semitic, anti-Zionists going on and on and on about, you know, uh, uh Zionism, the evils of Zionism, that sort of thing. Hold on, here it is. Ready? I'm gonna read you guys something. This is profound. As unfathomable as six million murders are, the, mur the murder of that many human beings is grotesquely inadequate description of the losses of the Holocaust. Imagine, for instance, the deliberate murders of six million French citizens, civilians, including 1.5 million French children, 1.5 million Jewish children were murdered in the Holocaust. Did you know that? Of the 6 million, 1.5 million were children. Not merely killed in war, but slaughtered in mass executions. Elderly people and babies gassed to death or burned alive. If this happened, it would have been horrific. It would have been unconscionable. But out of tens of millions of French people, survivors would have outnumbered the victims and with them. So meaning that if 6 million French people had been had been taken out, there are tens of millions of French people and that the French would have endured. Uh, survivors would have outnumbered the victims and with them, France itself would have endured. In effect, the story would have been grim but triumphant one that we would tell about the Allied victory. So imagine that the, in an alternate reality, you have World War II happening and you have, instead of the Jews being the uh the primary uh liquidated in the holocaust it's actually french and that's what they're saying so because there are so many french it would it would uh it would of course it would be unconscionable it would be uh grim and 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 macabre this is not to justify one against the other but that but what this is what it's saying that really just uh, it it almost sends a it sends a tingle up my spine ready for this the same cannot be said of European Jews. Ready? This is so sad to me. This is so sad. Ready? I didn't even know this one until I read this. And, and I've had plenty of Holocaust education. The same cannot be said of European Jews 
who once populated up to a third, a third of many European towns and cities and whose ancient and complex civilization within Europe predated Christianity by centuries. You hear that? You realize that? So what does that mean? It's not to say that they're there first. It's this idea that here is a thing, Jews, who are deeply enrooted in Europe and their traditions and civilization and culture is deeply enmeshed, ingrained for centuries, in some cases longer than Christianity, Some in some cases. This civilization, which includes its own languages, I just said that, talking about Yiddish. It's Another one is Ladino, which doesn't exist. Ladino is still spoken, but it's so, it's even more endangered than Yiddish is. Every time our generation dies out, my grandmother just died. My grandmother, she could understand Yiddish. So could my other grandmother. That It's dying out, man. My children probably won't know any Yiddish words. Maybe if, if I pass them along to them. Ready for this? This this is the this is the this is the kicker here. This civilization, this Jewish civilization, which included its own languages, school systems, libraries, theaters, and publishing and film industries. The Jewish film industry, hello, in Ger especially in Germany, was all but burned out of the world. You hear that? Burned out of the world. Judaism survived Nazism just as it outlived its many other oppressors. And this is true. Let me look at look. We have we make up 0.02% of the world population. There are 14 million Jews in the world, about something like that. But Jewish life in Europe never recovered and almost certainly never will. This is the meaning of genocide. Let me take that. Let me read that last part one more time. Ready? This Jewish civilization, which, again, made up at some, in certain towns and cities of Europe, one third of certain towns and cities made up by this Jewish civilization. This is a very generalized statement, obviously. Uh, this civilization, which included its own Jewish languages, its own Jewish school systems, its own Jewish libraries, Jewish theaters and Jewish publishing and Jewish film industries was all but burned out of the world. It doesn't exist anymore. Judaism survived just as it out. And there's a lot of criticize. There's a lot of criticism about Israel. We should not all be in one place. Lest the Holocaust happen again. And we're all wiped out at once. So there are some people who think that Jews and what's called, it's known as the dysphoria that we live everywhere so that we can never truly be exterminated because some people think we're cockroaches. But Jewish life in Europe never recovered and almost certainly never will. That is the meaning of genocide. Because what happened? What happened to all that stuff I was just saying? What happened to all that, that stuff I was talking about in, uh, in all those institutions and systems? Did they come back after the Holocaust? No. No, did the did the Jews who were displaced in Europe did they ever get their land back? Did they ever get their riches? You ever heard about all the paintings that were stolen from the Jews? Did they ever get any of it back? No. And then people have the chutzpah to say, "How dare you? How dare you go back to your ancestral homeland in the Middle East? That's not yours. You don't belong there. So where are they supposed to go?" <laughs> motherfucker where do you want them to go they were all but vanquished from the fucking earth in europe and they have nowhere to go they go to israel it's crazy and then you know what happened there the fucking jews in all of the arab countries surrounding that area were kicked out my wife's family my wife my wife's whole family is from iraq basically iraq and libya her, 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 on her mother's side, her, her, her grandfather, who I know, Sa Saba Sami, they were all forced. He was forced at eight years old to leave Kirkuk, Iraq, because of the formation of Israel. He had to leave. He had to, they had to leave all of their, they were bankers. They had to leave everything behind because they were Jewish and because 
people were so upset that Israel had formed as a result of the Holocaust and Europe and a bunch of other shit. Long ass, ta long ass tangent, but long ass tangent. But you see my point, the impact, why, why these, these dudes wanted to fucking just fucking beat the shit out of these Nazis. Uh, oh, see, here we go. You remember how I was talking about Jewish conspiracy theorists? So our buddy here who's lamenting that Christians, he's saying that Christians and gay people are not remembered at at Holocaust sites. Now he's using the, the, the Soros word. Anytime you hear Soros come up in conversation, that is Jewish conspiracy theory. George Soros, a Jew, very wealthy Jew who owns vast who's pulling the strings he's a part of the illuminati he's stealing all those riches from the jews jews stole from jews okay that's enough of ryan we know what kind of guy ryan is now there are certain buzzwords again when you hear someone swap out the word zionist for uh, jew for zionist you know what they mean hey ryan what do you think of zionist let's see what ryan thinks of zionist i i, I bet i know what he thinks of zionist if we know what he thinks of George Soros. <laughs> Soros worked for the Nazis. Oh, this is this is too good, man. This is too good. You know, Ryan, when you made your comments about uh, the Christians and the gays, uh, I, I had a suspicion. But as soon as you brought up George Soros, oh, you just you blew it wide open. Wide open, buddy. Okay. Okay, you can go back to your cesspool now. Thank you. Bye. Okay. So in early 1938, Nathan D. Perlman, Meyer Lansky, and Rabbi Stephen Weiss. So that's going back to the, the setup. The, uh, the judge, the mobster, and the rabbi, all Jewish, met to discuss the plan. Lansky's had one request for the rabbi. No negative press comments from the Jewish community leaders. He agreed. Lansky had his Brownsville boys trained by boxers for maximum effect. The April 20th Bund March at Yorkville Casino awaited. Um, as Benson recounts, Perlman had offered Lansky compensation for work, but Lansky refused. I need no pay, judge, he said. Oh, now it all comes together. This is noodles. Okay. Now it all now it makes sense. Okay. Oh boy. Um, as Benson recounts, Perlman had offered Lansky compensation for the work, but Lansky refused. I need no pay, Judge. So so Perlman wanted to pay the mobster because you know, mobsters they 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 operate money talks, right? And um, and he didn't need it. He did not need it. How the Jewish mob won the Battle of Yorkville. Although far outnumbered by more than 3,000 Nazis, the Jewish mobsters. Wow, that's crazy. Although far outnumbered by more than 3,000 Nazis, the Jewish mobsters dished out their version of justice on April 20th, 1938. The Bund presented the external illusion of strength through, through Nazi imagery but they were cowardly inside and they were no match for the Jewish gangsters fists and baseball bats. This is like every single, you know, you got the Maccabees, you got, it's like, it's like all of them. It's all of them. The, the, uh, what, what were they in the, uh, uh, God in 1948 in the war of independence, you have the Palmad. Uh, they were just, just friggin' awesome. Yes, Greg, I agree, man. He was quite clearly, he was a proud patriot, man. He was a proud patriot, for sure. Um, afterward, through Nazi imagery, but they were cowardly inside. Right. Afterward, Lansky and his men made their escape, but not after dropping their weapons at the American Legion. Wait, hold on. Afterward, Lansky and his men made their escape, but not after dropping their weapons at the and the American Legion hats they had worn for subterfuge. So they had sort of disguised themselves. <laughs> I'm not even going to acknowledge this. 
In the bloody aftermath, many of the Nazis lay unconscious. Others suffered compound fractures of limbs, according to the New York Post. Um, mobster Meyer Lansky, here you go, who enlisted a dozen men to break up a pro-Nazi rally in New York. Um, the waves made by the Battle of Yorkville would ripple across America, starting a movement pitting gangsters against Nazis, and the Bund was about to see how tough Jews could be elsewhere, too. In cities with strong Jewish mob representation, the gangsters were only too pleased to receive Lansky and Perlman's blessings. So Lansky had so much clout. He had so much pull. He was able to uh, he was able to go and, and, and do that. He was able to make it happen. Um, Jewish gangsters across the country fought the Nazis. Shortly after the Yorkville incident, New York City banned the Bund from wearing their uniforms in the city. So they hopped across the Hudson River to Newark, New Jersey. But there, Lansky had the Al Capone of Newark, Abner Longy, Abner Longy Zil Zwilman, waiting, Zilman, recruited an underground band of boxers dubbed the Newark Minutemen to take them on. This really is, this is like, this is like, uh, this is like a Gangs of New York type situation here. Mind you, there's also another show. There was a miniseries on HBO that talked about, it was like set, it was like in a fictional, it was like an alternate universe where it talked about the rise, it was the rise of American Nazism. And it had the dude that traveled in the airplane. He was like running for president. Really, really good show. I forget the name of it. Um, really great. So Abe Zwillman, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, chose former Jewish professional boxer Nat Arno, the fighting Hebrew, I love that, as the commander of the Minutemen. Their mission was to physically challenge the Bund at every meeting. This is literally like what happens between Antifa and Proud Boys. Their mission was to physically challenge the Bund at every meeting. The Minutemen soon numbered in the thousands, according to the Times of Israel. Um, there you go. Who is that in this picture? This is Fritz Kuhn, was arrested in 1939 and convicted of tax evasion and embezzlement before he was eventually deported to Germany after World War II. So they they got him with they got him through his taxes. And they got thank you, Greg. The plot against America. That's what it was called. Thank you. Great miniseries. If anybody wants to understand that anti-Semitism that I'm talking about, if you really want to see like like that that insidious sort of like low-key anti-Semitism, watch the plot against America. It is fiction, but it is super duper realistic. I mean, it is so it's uh, it's obviously very mired in real history and it's just it's very, very realistic. Check that out. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. In Chicago, the mobster's Jewish financer and political fixer Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik, Guzik got a call from Perlman. I love this. So basically, this mobster network, this Jewish mobster network, just like took out all the Nazis in America. <laughs> so great. Um, he got the call from Perlman and Lansky. Father Charles Conlin, a ca oh, that's who, Greg, you were talking about him. Uh, a Catholic priest was the chief investigator of anti-Semitic diatribes through his national radio platform. He spread his message of hatred against the Jewish community. Uh, Guzik assembled his group of Jewish boxers to take him on. In Detroit and Cleveland, the Jewish mob was also more than happy to dish out good old-fashioned Nazi whooping. It was their patriotic duty as American Jews. I love that, man. The fight the fight even made it as far as Los Angeles, where Jewish gangster Mickey Cohen found himself in a police station with men wearing uniforms of the Bund, according to Tablet Magazine. When officers left the room, Cohen stood up, approached the Nazis, and banged their heads together. The men screamed, jumping onto the bars of the nearby holding cell in an attempt to climb away. 
By 1939, Perlman's plan of directing Jewish mobsters to create Nazi intimidation groups was working. That so Pearl so Perlman like he established a, a network of of Antifa. This was Antifa, man. This was Antifa. Um. Then Pearl Harbor changed everything. You know, all right, I'm going to I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to acknowledge it cuz it's in the comments and and uh, it's harassment. You got this guy, you got this guy Noodles here who has made um some very borderline anti-semitic comments in the past who I have just ignored. I just, you know, cuz I I just I know. I know I know when I hear the language, I know it. And this is just a perfect example of everything we're talking about. Here's this guy who's 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 he's he's tipping me right now, and he's going, "Do you want more money?" And he's putting up money bags. Look at this! Har this is harassment. This is disgusting harassment, man. You know what this is the equivalent of? Do you know what some people do to Jews or what they used to do to Jews? They used to throw pennies. I I know Jews. I have I have Jewish friends. I think it might have even happened to me a few times. Or someone will throw a penny at your feet in hopes that that, that they're going to pick it up. That's how this comes off. Noodles, that's how this comes off right now. So you can stop. Save your, save your money, okay? Save your money. It's not needed. Thank you. Please, just stop. Just stop already. Um, no, Rue, I don't know this guy at all. He, I don't know him at all, man. I don't know him at all. He came on the show one time and he likes, you know, some of the misfits content, but you know, he started saying some things. He started making comments in the chat that I didn't find uh, that I thought were rather unsavory. If I'm being honest about Jews. And I just started, I said, Oh, you know what? I'm going to ignore this guy. I don't really, you know, I'm just going to ignore this. I don't like it. And, uh, and now here he is, he's talking about George Soros and he's talking about, uh, you know, trying to say that people that American Jews don't honor or respect non-Jews who perished in the Holocaust. Get the get the hell out of here with that, man. Come on, noodles with that nonsense. He's pretending to be somebody else, uh, somebody who's German. And now he's he's tipping me. He's throwing money at me again. That's what they do. You throw money at the Jew. Huh? I think that's funny. It's not funny, dude. No one appreciates it. I don't appreciate it. I mean, I'm serious. Have you ever had a penny thrown at your feet? No, because you're not a Jew. That happens to Jews. Yes, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Fuck. Oh. Um, you're Jewish. You're Jewish. I don't believe it. Noodles. <laughs> Ugh. All right, let's finish this out. By 1939, Perlman's plan of directing Jewish mobsters to create Nazi intimidation groups was working. Then Pearl Harbor changed everything. The German-American Bund could no longer hide behind the Constitution. Any speeches, marches, and gatherings were now considered sedition. So it started to increase, right? It started to, it started to uh, grow. It started to grow. He created this network. And hopefully this can happen right now. Maybe, I don't know if it's Antifa, you know, um, but some of the forces that are fighting against these Proud Boys and the alt-right, hopefully we can have, you know, traditional mobsters. They don't exist anymore. You know, like the mob exists, but it's not the mob. The, these in this day and age, the mob is like it's like the devil, right? Like the devil's best trick is convincing you that he doesn't exist. The mob, it's like the mob doesn't want you to know it exists anymore. And you know, it used to be that like the mob, like you knew who was in the mob, and like that the mob was like prevalent and around, and you know, New Jersey sanitation and whatnot, whatever. And now it's a little bit more. It's it's hidden. It's it's hidden. It's hidden for obvious reasons with everything that happened. Look what happened to Gotti and all the big bo bosses that went down in the eighties. That sort of thing. So it's like, it's not the same. Like you're not going to have that same element taking on Proud Boys in this day and age. But it's just interesting how history cycles and repeats itself. The German American Bund could no longer hide behind the Constitution. Any speeches, marches, and gatherings 
were now considered sedition. U.S. citizens took up the challenge themselves, and German-American BUN members could now no longer apply for shipbuilding jobs, preventing potential sab sabotage during the war. In the battle of gangsters versus Nazis, the gangsters won. It's amazing. After learning about the pre-World War II battle between gangsters and American Nazis, read about how uh, Italian mobster Lucky Luciano helped make the Allied invasion of Sicily possible with Operation Husky. That we'll, we'll bookmark that. Then go inside the failed German plot to assassinate Hitler during Operation Valkyrie. We know about that because of the Tom Cruise movie. Um. So yeah. That's that's the wow. Greg says that the mob now supports the right wing. That's interesting. Huh. Hmm. I did not know that. Um okay. I think that brings us to the end of our show. I'm sorry for the unpleasantness, uh, you know, sort of breaking uh my patience with with that sort of stuff it's just that you know again y there is i don't know how to describe this but this is this is something that these are things that jews deal with or that some jews have deal dealt with and it's not pleasant dude and when someone pushes your buttons sometimes you can't ignore it and you have to address it and considering the subject matter it had to be addressed today this time uh, what's up, Vamp Vampir Pyro Vampiro? Um, I don't know what else to say. I think that's basically the end of our broadcast today. And uh, we'll be back talking about Tommy Ramone later this week. Keep your eyes peeled. I have all sorts of videos coming up. I might pop up with another live live stream later on in the week. We'll see. Um, I'll leave you with the Patreon message. Let's do that. Hold on. I got to pull this up real quick. It's going to let me. Exactly an hour and 16 minutes. That's good. Okay, guys. I'll see you next time. Peace and hair grease. Check out the Patreon. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time, uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6 and 66 cents. <laughs> The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind-the-scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces 
Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.